window, no window. Look at the videos and the stuff that could be you. Because they like this to is Don, 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 Don. And everybody on the East Coast calls me Don. I'm like, what is Don? My, my mom thought I was uh, on Long Island, but I was at Howard Homecoming. Ready? Turn it up. Let's go. Welcome, everyone. You are now tuned into another amazing edition of Sonya on Air. I'm your host, Sonya Hudson Payne. And how do I start off each and every single show? You guessed it. I have another great show for you. Coming up in just a few short moments, I have none other than rapper and actor Marquise Moore, who can currently be seen in 50 Cent's highly anticipated series now showing on the Stars cable channel, BMF, which stands for the Black Mafia Family. Now, if you don't know anything about this series, what have you been doing? Let me just tell you a little bit about this show. So this is a true story that shows the real life experiences of two brothers, Big Meech and Southwest T, who start off as small time drug dealers, but then evolve to become one of the most powerful crime families the United States and abroad has ever seen. Sounds interesting, right? So make sure that you stay tuned because he'll be joining us in just a few short moments. But do me a favor, make sure you're subscribed. And if you're watching this on YouTube, hit the notification button too. Sign your on air and power a power. With everyone wearing masks, why not let your clothing do the talking for you? Visit Sign your on air and power apparel using the link in the description section of this episode and purchase premium t-shirts and various empowering things. All clothing is 100% premium cotton from sizes small to two extra large. Welcome to joining us on Sign You On Air. Thank you for coming back. So as I promised you at the onset of the show, I have none other than actor and rapper Marquise Moore. His story is amazing. Trust me when I tell you. Pivotal moments that we will really unpack. He has a powerful story that I'm sure will impact so many people. So make sure you tune in for every single word. Hi, Marquise. Hi, how you doing? I'm fine. How are you? Good, good. I just put my son to sleep, so I'm a little tired, but I'm good. I feel great. Uh, look at you doing daddy duties and then jumping into an interview. Let me find out. Hey, every day. Every day is like this. I love it. I love it. Oh, my gosh. How old is your son? Three months today. Oh, you have a baby baby. I have a baby baby. Yeah. Wow. What is yeah. that like? I never experienced this part. Um, I always felt, you know, I always was off doing work. When I was married, I'm divorced now. I was always working. And then I figured the women will do that. Um, I didn't realize how dope it is, like to change diapers and to have that bond. It's a lot of brothers missing out by not knowing that because it's dope. Yeah. I have him more than his mother. I don't like letting them go. Oh, <laughs> how old? You have an older child? Is that your youngest? I'm that's my youngest. I have four children total. And how old is the oldest? 14. Oh, so you have a three month old and then a 14 year old. Now that's yep. a huge difference, yes. different type of conversations, different responsibilities. Yeah, I'm a different man. It's, it's a whole different dynamic. It's dope though. I yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's I cool. recommend parenthood uh, to just about anybody. I, I know it definitely changed my life. Yeah, for sure. This, this kid in particular, I think is changing me the most. Really? Out of all my children, absolutely. That's Why? Um, because I'm accepting the responsibility. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean, and enjoying the whole process versus trying to run from it. And mm -hmm. here's some money. Let me go run away from this. No, I'm here. I'm here all the time. So that sh shows a sign of maturity. So when did you find that mental shift where you said, you know what, I need to start, you know, being more involved in raising my children? I think. Wow, we're getting deep fast. Um, I think <laughs> it, was, it, was me, it was not having the relationship with my oldest daughter that I thought I would have or thought I had. See, a lot of times men think that things are okay, everything is, is going well, but time is going by. 
you don't realize that. You think she remembers last summer, but no. You know, these kids need you every single day. Um, I think that's the one thing that um, I think about. Yeah. You know, missing that time, missing that time with my oldest daughter and seeing how that affected our relationship. I don't want to do that with him. So now that you know that miss, miss time affected the relationship with your oldest daughter, what are you doing now to kind of mend the relationship or fix it? She's a teenager, so that's tough. <laughs> I just don't give up on her. I send her text messages every day. Good. And then I know she'll come back around. You know, at the end of the day, I was a teenager. I remember rebelling. I remember yeah. feeling the same way she felt like I had the worst parents in the world. And I didn't understand my mother and father until I became a man and became an adult. And it's like, okay, I get it. You weren't perfect. I thought you had all the answers. I felt betrayed by my parents because I realized they were human. Um, and, and my daughter probably feels the same way right now, but I, I believe one day she'll see the difference. She will, she will. Um, I'm, a, I'm a mother of a 26 year old daughter. And I remember when there was a shift where she started to see me as the individual and not mm. as this mommy who wore the cape. Right. Right. I decided to have those real conversations with her because I needed her to understand that I'm flawed and I'm going to make mistakes. So I'm glad that you are persisting through the uncomfortable moments of yeah. you know your daughter's teenage mind. She'll come around. Trust me on this. Yeah, day. she will. She will. No. But for our dads, we we tough on ourselves more than they think. Uh -huh. I know she'll come around. It's she'll, my come baby. around. she'll come yeah. around. But you know what, Marquise, as I was researching and preparing for this interview, I said, oh, my gosh. So <laughs> I just didn't see you on, you know, 50 Cent's BMF. I saw you in 2008. <laughs> oh, boy. G's to Jets. <laughs> From G's to Jets. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> now, when I'm having conversations with a lot of actors or singers who got their start on reality TV, sometimes it was intentional because it was a stepping stone to get into the acting world. When you were casted on For G's and Gents, did you have aspirations to become an actor or were you just wanting to be on television on reality TV? Um, actually, a lot of people, this is a misconception. Hopefully I can clear it up on your podcast. I was already an actor. I did ATL before I did G's to Gents. Um, I, I did G's to Gents because I do music as well. And I know the type of the audience I was trying to reach only respected a certain type of person. So I wanted to show I had that in me, so to speak. And my, I remember my agent, everybody telling me, don't do that damn show. They were like, don't do it. I did it. And they told me, all right, don't be yourself when you go on that show. <laughs> I did. And uh, they're like, don't hit anybody. You I did. did. <laughs> yeah, and it, everything you could do wrong on reality TV, I did it. I was everybody's uh, sacrificial lamb. Now they don't even let people fight. <laughs> <laughs> you mess it up for everybody, Marquise. I, I sure did. <laughs> I sure did, boy. <laughs> but you know, okay, so I'm, that answered my questions. I was just like, you know, was he just doing that for the camera? Mm -mm. <laughs> it was, you know what? And I was just talking to a friend of mine. She's a reality show star. Um, uh -huh. And I was, she was just telling me about the reality show life. I told her, when you go back on that show, decide the side of you that you want to show them and only give them that. Because yeah. when you're a real person and you show people you're a real person, there's levels to that. So they might decide to only show you crying or only show you mad. When all everybody goes through stages and phases, but they're only going to show the stuff that's entertaining. They're not going to show you praying or doing the humble things that you do. Right. So don't don't give them the extra ammunition if you don't want them to show it because they're going to do it. So true. So true. So you mentioned that you were trying to reach a certain audience that would be attracted to your music. Right. Our keys. <laughs> I looked at one video. <laughs> I said, oh, this ain't for children. <laughs> None of my music is for children. Um, you know what? That's not true. I got a song called Nervous that my daughters love. Okay. It's my single. I got a group called Pool Boys for so me and my brother, Dre P. That song is beautiful. It's a dope song. It's a song about your first kiss. Mm. Um, 
And it was fun making that record. But my music is reality. I, I call it reality music from different stages of my life because it's honest to what I was feeling at that time. I never made, made music to try to like be accepted. I always made music from the perspective of where I was at in that moment. Now, looking back at some of the music I made, I might cringe a little bit because I've grown. I've grown. So it's like, I don't feel that way anymore. But it's, it was genuine in that moment. Got you. Got you. I, I love that you mentioned that because this is what people tend to do. You will do something 10 years ago and they think that you're the same person today. They don't give you permission to grow. Right. So I'm glad that you mentioned, you know, some of the music that you made, that was your experience back then. That yeah, made I was angry. Today. I was such an angry young man. Um, when I look back at it, I was so, I, I would hug myself. If I can go back and, and talk to that 21 year old on G's the Gents, I just give him a big ass hug. Like, yo, you're going to make it. You don't have to be so angry. Let the chip off your shoulder. Let go. You're going to be all right. But you know what I, what I respect about, even though you said that you did everything wrong from um, on G's to Gents, you still managed to navigate through the industry and still book jobs. So when you went to on casting calls, did they bring up, oh, that's Marquise Moore. We just saw him on from G's to Gents fighting on the reunion. Yeah hire him what was that experience like it never stopped but it wasn't really g's the gents it was a bunch of other negative stuff that people were more concerned about than g's the gents okay. the people that you know were in control of the, the industry that i'm in they don't watch g's the gents mm -hmm. so a lot of them don't even know that i was on that reality show it. it was other stuff in the press that they paid attention to and it's always been a fight shout out to gail tassel my manager who's been with me for 15 years uh, I've had the same agent for almost 10 years now. And these are people that have always had to put up that fight for me. Like, even when I got a role, there was like the, oh, okay, what about this? And they would go to bat for me. Mm -hmm. And my job was to show up on set and show a different me so that they'd be like, oh, we had this guy all wrong. And I've been consistently able to do that. That's why I'm working. Yeah, you are dropping gems, Marquise. Because I'm telling you, there is someone watching this, someone tuning in who is trying to be, you know, an established actor who may have had some obstacles and challenges in the right. past. And they need to hear and understand that although there have been obstacles and challenges in the past, you can persist. You keep, keep on. on. Keep, on. keep, keep on. on. But, you know, you mentioned, you know, that song that your your, your children like, it, it described your first kiss. Tell me about your first kiss. It was at a water fountain. <laughs> and it was Leslie Zeladon. I'll never forget. And it was this other kid that liked her that everybody was scared of. When he found out I kissed her, he was mad he wanted to fight me. I don't know if he fought her. I don't think so. But yeah, that was cool. And how I old were you? Six. What, what? Six years old. I was fresh. <laughs> I was a fresh little boy. Oh, you was a type of boy my mama told me. Uh, stay stay with you <laughs> I used to spray my father's cologne on letters and write letters to my three girlfriends. Not three girlfriends. I had three girlfriends. I was a piece of work, boy. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> since you believed in um, being um, polyamorous <laughs> at, at a young age, <laughs> how do you feel about relationships now? Do you feel that you can be monogamous or you just Me? want to spread the love? Yeah, you. Um, I don't really think about relationships as, as you know, at all anymore. Um, I think I'm traumatized by all my past stuff and relationships. I just want friendship. I don't even be looking for that relationship stuff because it's a trust thing for me, like to open up to people and have to go through that process over and over again until you find the one. I don't believe there's a one. I think it's just find a friend and keep them for life. If it turns into something else, then that's the one. <laughs> so what, what trauma did you experience in relationships? Were you the one that was constantly cheated on? Uh, I think it was both. Now, I know it was both. Um, I could have been the one to start it, uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> but it definitely was a, a two-way street on yeah. all levels, from abuse to, from me being an abuser to being abused, all of that, to all of that. It was just too much. Then I got married in my 20s. I think that's the time where you go through most of your mistakes. <laughs> so to get married that young and not really have proper direction, her mother wasn't stable. My mother wasn't stable. Her father wasn't stable. My father didn't give a damn about what I was doing. So we didn't have, you know, guidance. 
We still needed guidance in our 20s. I told my father recently, I said, I need you more now as a grown man than I did when I was a kid. You know, show me how to be a man. Hmm. So what, specifically tell me, like, what do you need your father more for now as a grown man? Um, I always call him just to, to advice on navigating just being imperfect. You know what I mean? And fighting through it. Like, how did you make it look so good? How did you make it look so good? I ask my father all the time. Like, I never knew you to be imperfect. I never saw him have a flaw. But obviously, he's divorced. He's been through some things. So he wasn't perfect. I just never saw it. Right. So, you know, I want to know, how do you carry yourself so well and, and face all these problems and still able to come out on top? I guess I kind of figured it out, too. But th that's why men need their fathers, even as grown men. You know, I've Tell never heard anyone you. say that before. And that really? is so, yeah, that's really deep because I've always assumed that little boys needed their fathers more than grown men do. But you mm. just changed my whole perspective on that. So I'm really going to be having a few conversations, you know, mm. able to talk with a few people just to unpack yeah. this a little bit more because that's real powerful. Yeah, like I used to get into arguments with my with my um, ex-wife and I had nobody to give me good advice. Like my friends was on BS. So they would tell me bad advice, toxic advice. And I would take that into my marriage mm -hmm. and, and enforce it, thinking I was in control, enforce it. Right. You know, having a father to be like, listen, son, y'all going to go through things. This is how you handle that. Go do this. Tell her you love her right now. Like those little small things matter, man. Having a grandfather to guide you in raising your son matters. It does. Oh, wow. I'm sitting here like, I'm telling you, that's, that's just really, really powerful. You know, and I'm glad that you've come to this heightened sense of awareness and able to communicate what you need as a grown man. Because sometimes, you know, I would say Black men specifically, in their adulthood, they get stuck on how to navigate being imperfect. Right. They beat right. themselves up and they stay in that space, you know. So I'm yep. glad you are actively seeking help for that. Oh, my baby. Oh, your baby? Uh -oh. Yeah, I just want to check on him real quick. Oh, shit. What, was he crying or? No, I'm just like that. Oh, oh look, at, look at daddy duties. Look at daddy duties. He get oh. <laughs> He'll be up in a second. Let me get the hell out of here. <laughs> I was like, I'm with the baby. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I just had to check on real quick. So, you know, and also the dealing with the conversation of navigating through, you know, being imperfect and, and mental space. Mental health is very, very important for me. It's the key. It's key. It's, key. it's essential. Key. I want to, you know, touch on something and, you know, just let me know if you don't. There's no limits. I don't I don't do limits. If it happens, we'll talk about it. You know, Thank I'll you. always be honest. People just don't be asking the right questions. Got you. Got you. <laughs> because there was a period of in your life where you lost your grandmother and you, you attempted suicide. Yes. And because of the failed attempt, you realized that you had made a mistake. Yes. When did you come to the realization that, oh, wow, I'm glad that I'm alive and I didn't kill myself? Wow. When did I come to the realization that I was glad I was alive and I didn't kill myself? Was it immediately um, thereafter, five days later? No, like right, right after I was upset. I, I, see, here's the thing. What pushes a person to that point, a lot of people don't understand what would make somebody who seems to have everything going for themselves or anybody. They think it's weakness. But at that moment, I thought that I was so toxic and just so bad. It wasn't just my grandmother. She was the voice of reason and she wasn't there anymore. And I had just came home from prison. A lot of people don't know that. I did almost three years in prison. I was home maybe two months. So I was dealing with probation. I was dealing with um, you know, my grandmother's passed and she died while I was in prison a couple days before I was released. And she was my best friend. So all of that on top of me feeling like my family and friends would actually be better off without me. I thought I was a burden to them. So I figured it wasn't like the easy way out. I was doing what was best for them. And that time I thought that that was, you know, that was my way of thinking. So I did that with confidence. I'm like, I'm going to do this. And it's better for them. They'll be sad for a little while, but it's better for them. When I woke up, 
I was angry because I felt like I failed. Like, damn, you can't even do that right. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until Russell Simmons, this is somebody who I looked up to, um, made me realize that he saw me. Like, he made a comment on social media and was like, praying for Marquise Moore. That was the first time any celebrity ever acknowledged that I existed. You know, so to me, it was like, whoa, I'm, they, he, somebody cares. And then I saw thousands of people, because for so long, I thought everybody thought I was this monster, this horrible person, this thug, and nobody liked me. So to see people saying they're praying for me, it, it gave me strength to want to live. It gave me a reason to live. And I wanted to inspire people after that, you know? I get it. You know, I'm, so on, this journey. I'm on this journey. Yeah, shout out to Russell Simmons. Yeah, um, I'm on this journey right now while I'm encouraging everyone that I speak to. If you speak to someone else, make sure you really see them. All right. Because right. we jump into conversations, we jump into the work with other people and we don't even see the don't people. See we don't see them. He saw, he saw all the stuff that was going on in the world. He asked people to pray for me and I believe in prayer. Yeah. And the power of prayer. It was like, it was like all that energy was lifted off of me and I felt purposeful and I jumped right into it. Oh, yeah. Wow. You know, a guardian angel in the human flesh was sent to you. So I'm glad that, you know, mm -hmm. someone actually saw you and his oh. name is Russell Simmons. Yeah, so. Did you seek any type of professional help, a therapist? You know, it's so funny you said that because I did. And um, just today I was looking up a new therapist. I'm like, I got to get back into therapy. It's been a while. So I was just looking that up today. But I did. Um, I like therapy. I liked it a lot. I just moved around so much. I went from state to state doing work. So I didn't keep the same therapist. Um, but I encourage people to do it. It was dope being able to just talk to somebody because my problem is trust. And when you're dealing with heavy situations and heavy conversations, having someone that you can trust, for one, not to tell all your damn business as soon as y'all have a falling out, and also that you are that you feel safe enough to be that open with is important, you know, to get some of that baggage off of you. So I encourage people to, to get a therapist because it's somebody you can trust. Yeah. You know? yes. So don't finish or stop your search to secure a therapist. Um, you know, to help you navigate through the experience of being an imperfect black man. Right. right. So, Boy. yeah, <laughs> so, so important. Now, when you attempted suicide, um, from what I read, it was by taking Xanax and Patron. So yep. you mentioned that you did have a drug problem. Mm -hmm. Did you kick the drug problem or are you still? Well, I don't take pills. I smoke weed still. Okay. But then when I came home from jail, there was a lot of experimenting. I don't know what, what I was going through um, at that time. I think it was just like, again, self-hatred, like wanting to hurt myself and seeing how far I could go in bringing myself low. And this, this is also a funny thing about me. I don't know who else is like this, but I'm at my best when I'm humbled. It's, I don't know why, but it, it brought out the best in me once I hit rock bottom. Mm -hmm. It was like there was nowhere else to go. I had to face it. And I didn't I didn't give a damn what anybody thought because I felt like that was the lowest I could go. Right. You know. Yeah, I, I learned I've learned that about myself too. That when I am in the valley, mm. the lowest of lows, that is when I'm at my absolute best. And you shine. Because God, that's when God can shine through you. Exactly. Mm. He has to bring you to your knees. <laughs> really or, or you would take the credit. <laughs> yep. I would have took the credit. I can't take the credit. You've all have seen all the stuff that they've said, all the stuff that's on the internet. There's no way I am where I am because of my own efforts. So true. It's, it's a lot of people that got what you call it, blackballed in the industry for what they said, mm -hmm. let alone what they've done. God has been with me every step of the way. He got me here. Yeah. Because I never gave up on him. So while you were experimenting with drugs, how did you just stop? Um, probation. It was either stop or go to jail, go back to jail. And what happened, well, me taking the Xanax made my probation officer pay attention because it was all over TMZ, it was all over the news. They had no idea until they saw it on TMZ. But the approach normally would have been to lock me up, but because of the, the publicity behind it, there was more of an urgency to help me. Right. 
So instead of locking me up, you know, they helped me. They gave me some mental health uh, assistance and they really helped me. The federal probation really were supportive of me in my career and my journey. And they wanted to see me win. I hear a lot of stories with bad probation officers. I didn't have that. Mm -hmm. I had good probation officers, all of them. Get your groceries and essentials delivered in as fast as one hour via Instacart. Free delivery on your first order of $10 or more. Now football season is in full swing. Be sure to get everything you need for your football party so your friends won't talk about you, because I will. <laughs> Make sure you use the link in the description section and be taken directly to Instacart. Make that football party an event they won't forget. So this is an instance where being a celebrity works. Um, yeah. I know recently Shaquille O'Neal, he made a statement that he doesn't want to be a celebrity anymore. It's just too much. Do you think that you would say, I just want to leave the celebrity world alone and just be I ready? did that. That's exactly what I do. I do like stuff like this. I like doing because it's a little in depth and personal. Mm -hmm. I don't consider myself a celebrity. I'm an actor. I left that alone with G's to Gents. I left that alone. I don't want to be a celebrity. I don't really go to events. I might go to one. But that's not me. You know what I mean? I'm not trying to impress anyone. I just want to do good acting work, get my money, go home, and enjoy my life. You yeah. know? So enjoy your life. Tell me, what is a day in the life of Marquise Moore? I wake up, mm -hmm. make some coffee, make my calls. And it's sad. This is a traumatic thing, though. I always go to media takeout in the morning. Uh, I always do it because having woke up one day, to people blowing up my phone, saying you're on media takeout. And I go and it's the worst thing in the world. I think it did something to me. Like I'm always checking it to make sure, yeah, to make sure my name don't pop up. You know what that might be? And I had to learn this too. There was a portion of my life where I had to realize, damn it, I'm addicted to, to, tra to trauma. I'm addicted to- My own trauma. Uh -huh. My own trauma. That's being addicted to trauma. If you yeah. know that media takeout gave you information anxiety, yeah, anxiety why revisit the scene of why the crime? are you doing it i do though i'm not gonna lie i do i check it i go to tmz and then i start my day um usually that consists of my son coming over and me being with him i got him from 11 to 11 every day so it's just about him for the most part and i do my acting classes i teach one-on-one -on -one acting classes um on zoom and yeah. my schedule is pretty full with that and it keeps me sharp as an actor i love doing yeah. it I love so that brings me to another topic. I love how you've monetized your brand. Oh, thank you. A lot of people, you know, they just want to act or they want to produce, but they don't know how to monetize what they do. Right. When I looked at your site, not only, you know, the acting classes, you do credit repair, yes. you encourage people to do a TikTok video or yes. one of your songs. One of my songs, yeah. Yeah. So how did you figure out I need to bring in more money and these are the ways to do it. Cause not everybody gets to that point where they realize how to monetize their brand. How did you come to that realization? Copied the people that were winning. Yeah. <laughs> That's all I did. I looked at who was winning and I copied their format. And that's it. <laughs> yes. Most people don't know that like every day, no lie Marquise, I am listening to about four hours of the top podcast yeah. every day. Feel you. Yeah, because you can't be successful if you don't follow a successful blueprint. That's right. So I'm glad that you mentioned that. Like, I knew the answer, but I wanted to make sure that you let my listeners know. <laughs> yeah. You want to be the best or you want to be in the same league as some of the best, you got to do what they do. There's yeah. no way around it. Yeah. So let's talk about your current role a little bit. Yeah. Um, yeah. On 50 Cent's highly anticipated series, Black Mom yeah. Family or BMF. How did you get the role and tell us about it? <clears throat> um, first of all, when I heard that 50 was doing the project, I called my manager and my agent. I got to get on this. I got to get on this. I know some of the real people who are still incarcerated. I just felt like it was a part of my story in a way, too, because I came to Atlanta in 2003. BMF had a big bill. First thing I saw was a billboard that said BMF. The world is BMFs. And I never saw black people that united before, ever. Mm -hmm. I never saw black people from a bunch of different places representing one thing and doing it in a way where it's not dis, uh, you know, disconnected. Everybody moved on one accord, mm -hmm. you know, and everybody 
appeared to be doing well. It wasn't like you saw one guy right. who was on. Everybody who was around BMF was getting money. Now we all know the, the rest of the story, but I never saw anything like that coming from where I was from. It was always crabs in the bucket, in the barrel. So when I heard about the project, I hit up my agent and my manager, and then I saw people online doing like these mock auditions because 50 put out something like, sending your tape, I'm gonna cast this through Instagram. My agent was like, don't you dare mm. do no damn Instagram tape. You wait until that's done and we'll get you an audition. Mm. That's exactly what we did. We waited till that was done. <laughs> And then she got me to audition. I originally auditioned for the role of J-Mo. Okay. It was Tasha Smith who said I was better for the role of Phil Mel. She was amazing. like, nah, I love her. She's my favorite director, mm. hands down. Probably one of my most favorite people that I've ever encountered. And she's from Jersey, so shout out to her. Are you from I love Jersey? Her. Yep. Ah, uh, okay, we're not too far. Jersey. Brooklyn, okay. okay. Right. <laughs> yeah, ain't nothing but over the bridge. Yeah. So you got the audition. Go ahead. Um, again, I auditioned for J-Mo. So I got the part of Phil Mel through my audition for J-Mo. Okay. So I never auditioned for Phil Mel. I auditioned for J-Mo and I got the part. Um, we did the table read. When I got the phone call, I didn't believe it. I was like, oh, snap, I'm about to be on BMF. People not going to believe this. Then we did a table read on Zoom and seeing 50 made it all come like, I was like, oh, shit, this is happening. And I worked with 50 before on The Oath. It was a show he had on Crackle, which I loved doing. But this was different. This was something real. And I was a part of it. Mm. And it's over. Even being on set, like, I'm really a part of this. I better show my ass. <laughs> so I should let me, too. Good, good. I love when people, especially if you're, you're playing a role, but you can still be your true, authentic right. self. Right. Hey, speaking about that, I, I'm gonna be honest, Marquise. <laughs> Let's give it. Be honest, you know. I'm a Brooklyn, right. so we real honest. Give it a buck. I also saw you on Tyler Perry's The Pains. Was it The yes. Pains? I played Ryan Payne on The Pains. I didn't really like that role. It's okay. You know, I why? needed to do that role. Why? Even though it was different, a different role that I've ever seen you. Mm -hmm play so for that i can respect it it shows me that you had a different side mm -hmm. but it didn't seem like your true authentic self no it absolutely not it's the only time i ever felt like i was acting which i needed okay i needed that um because a lot of people would have said oh you're typecasted but then i send them to the pains and i go no i'm not i have range and it was important that i showed that i had range right and so i can go back to doing the stuff i like but i wanted to do I wanted to become a series regular, doing something that was so opposite of myself. To just to show the world, like I'm a real actor. I'm, I'm I really do this. You know what yeah. I mean? Don't give me the thug all the time. I can right. play a goofball and pull it off. My mother hated Ryan. She hated him. <laughs> she said he's so damn dumb. Yes. <laughs> yes. But that's yes. fun to me, though. That's fun to me to, to play those type of characters. Because Ryan was so innocent. He didn't have a care in the world, you know, and I forgot what that felt like to be that innocent. So it was fun to get to play something like that. It really yeah. was. Now, don't get me wrong. You know, I respect that you showed range and I was like, yeah. oh, wow, this is a character that I haven't seen him play yet. I right. just didn't like that particular role, right. but the overall, you know, purpose okay. of it you did what needed to be done. <laughs> I appreciate you telling me you didn't like it though, because it's art at the end of the day. Like, you know, you might not like this painting. You might like this one. Somebody loves another person, like another person might love my role on the paintings and hate all the other stuff I've done. So to hear different perspectives is dope. Yeah, yeah. So back to BMF. So yeah. has the, the first season, have you finished filming? Yeah, we're done. So second season is right around the corner. And where was it filmed at? Atlanta, Detroit. I think those are only two places. Atlanta and Detroit. So mm -hmm. tell my viewers and my listeners more about your role. What's his name? Flannery, right? Phil Mel. Phil Mel, okay. Tell us about um, him. Phil Mel's from Detroit. He's a part of the 12th Street crew, which is the crew that, excuse me, the crew that is um, currently running the block. Meech's crew, the 50 boys, decide to encroach on our territory. And we're not too happy about that. So there's a meeting where we're like, you know, without giving too much, 
where we're basically like, you can't do that. Take your ass back up there. You're not from Ecos. You're not from this neighborhood. And there's an altercation. I encourage people to watch it, obviously, that is going to lead to some, some problems. Mm. It's going to get real, real, real soon, you guys. This show got a high body count. <laughs> So tell me if you without giving too much away, what will be the climax of high body count? High, that body. Means high body counts. I like that. Bodies gonna drop. <laughs> I like that. I'm a Brooklyn girl, so we can deal with that. Bodies <laughs> gonna drop. He told him, J Mo told him, he said, if you don't move, body's gonna drop. <laughs> wow. wow. So how many episodes is in the first season? Eight. Eight yep. episodes. Got yep. it. So your current character on BMF, what do you hope that your character will bring you next? My first lead, mm. my first lead role. I think this role, finally, for some reason, this role was, I knew this was gonna be the one that made people say, yo, dude is pretty consistent at this. Like he is the go-to guy for these. Now he can lead something. Now it's time for him to have his own, you know, number one spot. Now, don't get me wrong. I love supporting. I think acting is acting, regardless of what role I play. My fans in the audience that follows my work, I think they're ready to see me uh, carry a show or a movie. And I think BMF is the catalyst to that happening. Got it. So what is your dream role? Playing Elijah Muhammad in a biopic. Oh, I, I see the resemblance. <laughs> yes. You know, the reason why I'm like, oh my gosh, when I got into, let's say, an awareness about black people and where we're where we've been and where we're going, um, I read the the message to the black man by yes. the book changed my life. Amazing. Yes. That was the first book that really changed my mindset. It gave me a heightened sense of awareness. It gave and me purpose. As a man, as a black man, it gave me purpose because I felt like I lost my purpose for a while. I was doing things that I wasn't proud of as a man, just in general. I was so out of position. When I read that book, it it reawoke in that spirit in me that, you know, felt purpose driven. I felt like I had to, you know, get stronger. I had to do these things because I had a responsibility not only to my family, but to my people. And I think Elijah Muhammad, a lot of people, he, he gets a lot of slack for the so-called bad stuff, but the good stuff that he did doesn't get enough attention. Like this man really brought you some of the greatest black minds. Yeah. Uh, but even deeper than that, his wife was the one. A lot of people don't know her story. So mm -hmm. I want to do something where it tells Clara Muhammad's story. That mm -hmm. strong woman. Yeah. That was a know, strong woman. Those are the type of stories that we really need. You know, we yeah. always see these powerful men, but oftentimes it is the women behind yes. the side. Yes. Like, just to give you some insight on his story, uh -huh. uh, I studied Elijah Muhammad after reading Message to the Black Man. I really studied him because I saw the resemblance. Like, when I looked at him, I saw myself. Yes. And um, I started studying him in the story. And I read a book that talked about how, you know, during the Great Depression, he became an alcoholic. And he used to, like, get into fights at bars. Mind you, he was a little guy like me. He used to get into fights at bars, get beat up, and, and be, like, laid out on the side of the train tracks and Clara would have to go find him. And then she would take him home and bathe him. One time she cleaned him up and then said, I'm taking you to see a man. This is what's made her so special to me because she is like most women will just upgrade. Mm -hmm. if you ain't acting right nowadays. It's like, I'm just going to find me a better man. Right. She didn't do that. She took him to a better man and said, that's what I want you to be. Oh, wow. You know what I mean? And he did because of his wife. And then when he was incarcerated, she ran the Nation of Islam. It was her. It was Clara Muhammad that ran everything. The pressures of a black woman, man. We don't we don't understand, man. So no. I want to tell that story. And it's a love story. I don't want to tell the story of Elijah Muhammad, the militant uh, person filled with hate. I want to tell the story of the father, the husband, the brother, you know, that had love in his heart for his people. Right, right. We need that story. Yeah. We need that story. And I'm hope I will say that you speaking about it, you're putting it in the universe. We're going to manifest it happening. Yeah, somebody call Ryan Coogler. Tell him I want him to direct it. Yeah. Maybe that you should write great. the screenplay. I wrote some of it. Okay. So it's in the works. It's been in the works for quite some time. I talked with some of the members of the nation. 
and um, actually one of Elijah Muhammad's children. Mm. And here's an interesting thing too. The controversy with Elijah Muhammad, one of it was that he had these uh, children out of wedlock while he was married, a bunch of different kids by a bunch of different women. Well, had he not done that, there would be no one to tell his story because all the children from his original marriage are dead. Oh. So there would be no way for me to find out his story if I, did, if I wasn't able to tap into the ones that are living, which came from different relationships. Mm -hmm. So sometimes God's divine stuff may look like a mess to us from our point, but there's a greater purpose. Right. You know, step outside of our own judgments. Mm -hmm. We'll see that. It is those perfect imperfections. Right. Right. So, you know, just two last questions. The first one is, what advice do you have for emerging actors? Hmm. Even though you gave us so much. What advice do I have for emerging actors? Don't count the steps in your journey. Just do what's required at that moment and keep doing that. Like everybody has this like image of what success is gonna look like and it's just not true. It's not true. You'll never feel like you've made it ever, ever. You'll have moments where you're like, wow, this is nice. Get back to work. Right. Don't ever, you know what I mean? Get back to work. Stay humble. Um, don't ever get the big head because you will be humble. This industry will chew you up and spit you out if you think you're somebody. And I guess don't quit. Just don't quit. Quitters never get to anywhere, so why quit? You might as well just see it all the way through. If you start something, you might as well just see it all the way through. Right, right. Amazing words of advice. And I want to make sure that my viewers and my listeners can continue following you yeah. and watching your amazing journey so that yeah. that film comes out where you are starring as, you know, wow, um, as you film it, they can say, we've been following Marquise's journey since... Wow way back then. So where can they find you? What's your social media? Marquise Moore, M-A-R-K-I-C-E, Moore, M-O-O-R-E. That's everywhere. All the social media uh, outlets, my name is Marquise Moore. So just type that in there and you'll be able to find me. And I hit people back. I follow people. I engage all of that good stuff. Yeah, you do. Because when I hit you up, I was so surprised when you answered me back. I said, what? I'm talking to people. I don't mind. I like being interviewed because so long, nobody knew my story. Nobody knew anything about me. The media put things out there that just wasn't true. So I'm like, let me give my perspective of it so people can know. You know, They want to know. So I'm, I'm ready to tell them. And I'm glad you did. And this is what Sonya On Air does. I want to take those pivotal moments and those milestones. And I want to give people like you an opportunity to unpack them. <laughs> Because sometimes what we read about, what we see on the news, it's their story, right. your story from your right. Life. Right. And we all got one. We all, yeah. got, one. We all got one. Marcus, yeah. thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And to your listeners, thank you for staying tuned. And yeah. I hope to hear from some of y'all. Continue blessings to you and your children. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. There you have it. That was a great conversation. I don't know about you, but I definitely know about me. It gave me everything that I needed. Marquise came to do what needed to be done. He totally understood the assignment. So from our conversation, what we discussed, there were many pivotal moments and milestones, challenges, obstacles that Marquise had to overcome and endure. Um, the relationship the severed relationship with his 14 year old daughter, being incarcerated, um, being a drug abuser, physically abusing his girlfriend and also being physically abused, trying to mend the relationship with his father, trying to navigate through being an imperfect black man, um, incarceration, trying to find a therapist, but yet and still, he is a working actor navigating through it. One thing that we didn't really expand on, he's had the same agent for 10 years, which speaks volumes about loyalty. If you are trying to enter into this build, this uh, business or even you know just a life lesson in general, make sure that you surround yourself with people who are 
loyal, especially if you're trying to navigate through Holly weird, where everything is just smoke and mirrors, you know, it's all a facade and you really have to find people who are authentically themselves and who are very, very loyal. So make sure that you hit the subscribe button. If you are watching this on YouTube, make sure that you subscribe to every sign you're on your streaming platform. Um, make sure that you also hit the links in my description section for Instacart, um, for Buzzsprout. Um, just go into the description section. Shout out to everyone who has helped keep Sonya on air for the past, I'm in my 10th season. My 10th season. I thank you so much for tuning in. Smooches loves. Take care.